Hi, uh, welcome to Weekly Alb. I'm August March, the news editor, and today we're talking to Gus Pedrotti, one of the candidates for mayor here in the city of Albuquerque. The election is coming up on us in a couple of months in October. In fact, a couple of weeks ago, Weekly Alb hosted a mayoral forum uh, that allowed candidates to meet the public and meet with each other about several important issues that have come up during the election process. Mr. Pedrotti was noted, I'm sorry, Pedrotti, it's, it's one of those things, it's going to take me a while to get it right, um, was noted for some very sort of germane answers, some very uh, erudite conclusions that he made. We found that real fascinating here, to be honest with you, given the texture and, and fabric of, of the candidates who are running and the similarities between all of them. Uh, Mr. Pedrotti's actually been a little different in his approach and today we want to talk to him about his involvement in the campaign and his hopes and, and work to become the next mayor of Albuquerque. Uh, Gus Pedrotti, let me just start by asking you to introduce yourself. You're, you're a recent graduate of the University of New Mexico. You're someone that's been heavily involved in community issues and active in community groups, and now, now you're running for mayor. Why do you think you should be the next mayor of the city of Albuquerque? Of course, so to start with who I am, my name's Gus. Uh, I did just graduate from Un the University of New Mexico. Graduated with degrees in chemistry and psychology, so kind of an unlikely combination, but highlighted to me wonderful intersections between sciences and ideas and departments that allowed me to study music in a new way, looking at it through neural relations, so music in the brain. Wow. Um, and it was some of the most fun I've ever had. And it also allowed me to have interesting intersections with things like healthcare, because as we know, music is wonderfully helpful for neural degenerative diseases, sure. so things like Alzheimer's. And so I started working within healthcare infrastructure around the city, and I saw something I'd never expected to see. I saw people choosing solutions made specifically for our community working with the hepatitis C crisis, which comes from our heroin epidemic, which then disservices a large array of people in our city, as we know, all of us far too intimately. And I saw this plan of new healthcare service being drawn about and implemented throughout communities that have been disserviced in Albuquerque. And then I watched that healthcare model be implemented internationally, with new connections being made in our city, our neighbors, our friends, taking on some of the largest, most inundated structures in society today. And that changed things for me. It made me realize that nothing was too big, that it was all malleable, and all we had to do was participate and engage and provide new ideas. And from growing up here, from actually using our public schools, I graduated from Albuquerque High School before I went to the University of New Mexico, staying at UNM, being a YDI kid because we saw an ad in the alibi one day, all of these things let me know how I didn't fall through the cracks, how this city served me, how in some cases some of my friends didn't make it through those cracks and what we can do better. And so it's this real experience coming from just these years, knowing exactly what we have our hands on and how to do it better that makes me sure that I'm in the right place running for mayor and excited to have the opportunity to hopefully be able to take that office in October, December 1st, when any of us actually do. And it's about capitalizing on that identity <coughs> and that experience in the community to say that we know that cooperative endeavors between groups are more successful because the bottom line of our city is outcomes for citizens, making sure that we make the most of everyone, that everyone has equal opportunity, access, and fulfillment. And I feel like I'm a personal product of some of the most wonderful things the city has to offer. And I want to be sure our city hall celebrates that and engages people who are willing to contribute to that sphere. That's a really uh, interesting, very, very, uh intricate look at, at, at your reasons for being mayor. I kind of want to start at the beginning. Yeah. One of the things you talked about was healthcare mm -hmm. and your exposure to the healthcare and your understanding, knowledge, uh, your witnessing, as it were, of, of the, the healthcare crisis, the uh, drug crisis, and maybe how these things are tied to one of the big issues in the city, which is public safety. How important is healthcare for our citizens, especially for citizens who are marginalized on fixed incomes, don't have the sorts of resources that maybe you and I do, or maybe common citizens even do, um, which may lead to things like addiction and um, death, untimely death, young death, uh, criminal activity. 
Do you believe that if we, we actually provided more comprehensive, more planned out services for those citizens in our city, that, that maybe this huge thing they call the crime epidemic will, will begin to solve itself? The answer is yes. And to put it in no more simple terms than I can, health care and health is everything. You said it yourself, if you don't have proper health, you're going to be dead. And that's an outcome none of us are interested in. We tout our civilization as having this new life expectancy that we get to be more productive over more years because we have better health care. We have security in our bodies. And if any, anybody watching this or anybody personally has experienced what a health crisis does to your productivity, to your mental states, then you know how crippling it is. Mentally, physically, it's hard to engage in our society if you're not healthy. And we've seen this. Going back to when Ray Schultz was our police chief with the Hyde shootings, a uh, tragedy to our police force, we clearly showed we didn't have the capacity to deal with mental health in our communities. And this now created this massive culture of violence that turned into the Boyd shootings later and all of the ones in between, and that which brought this DOJ mandate on us. Of course health care is related to our public safety. Of course, of course health care is related to how we're looking and framing our police department right now. And we have chosen, we've chosen to not actually engage this as a problem we can fix. Behavioral health, uh, mental health, all of these things have to coalesce for a better community. And so when it comes down to public safety, if we don't give people resources to be better, to get the help they need, then we aren't going to feel safe. If it's us personally, we won't feel safe with ourselves. And if it's people that we don't understand what they're going through, we won't feel safe around them. It's about coming together as a community and bringing all of us up. As mayor, what sort of legislation would you bring to the city council? What sort of specific plans would you have that you want to see enacted toward those ends? Of course. So one of the biggest ways that we can start encouraging mental health, better outcomes for it, and seeing how that affects our city is through cooperating it with initiatives that already exist. So you take Albuquerque Heading Home right now, our, our city's flagship on how to try and care for homeless populations, and you pair it with existing health care infrastructure. Because one of the most interesting things that with all of these, Albuquerque Heading Home stands to save us money if it succeeds, if it gets people off the streets and if it gets them productive, right? right. That's how we're going to mm -hmm. make that money back. That's what we want for our city. Sure. But homelessness isn't just not having a home. It's everything that comes with it. It's the societal stigmas. It's the mental health and traumas that happen on the street. So you sure. have to approach that all sure. at once. I am so interested in holistic and contextualized solutions. Because we can't ignore or deny people their context anymore, especially in a city like Albuquerque. So they need jobs, too. People they need who, jobs. They don't just need a place yes. to live. They need some sort of way to make their lives meaningful and productive and yes. ultimately profitable for themselves and the city. Of course. So now we're, now we're talking about that good old Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Classic psychology term. UNM doing well for me right there. It's saying that we have a certain set of minimum needs before we can be productive before we can understand our free will, before we understand our choices in front of us. And so for me as mayor, what exactly would I do to encourage that? It's understanding, yes, we get them in homes. Then we pair, and we can do that through Yes Housing, through Albuquerque Heading Home, and we can create infrastructure for it. But we also need to address their, their health issues, and we can do that through initiatives like Project ECHO, the healthcare infrastructure that I talked about. Right. And so that model services more as a clinic-based model, which means that there's more access to different levels of community health members, whether or not it's just a community care worker all the way up to an MD, and we understand how to get people to the portion of care that they need faster which means we have more jobs open too. You don't have to go to medical school to care for people in your communities and provide important health care that saves lives. You can do it from where you are because your knowledge of your community, your neighborhood, what people are going through around you is worth the world. Do you think these sorts of plans and getting involved with programs that are already extant, like the ones you've talked about, is that gonna require an investment from the city? How are, I mean, what are the nuts and bolts? How yeah. are we gonna create some sort of contracts with these uh, groups, uh, funding, where would Where does the funding come from, right? That's, that's everyone's question. What about the money? It's wonderful because all of these things are trying their best to exist on their own already, right? We want greater nonprofit co cooperation in the city in the first place because we know nonprofits are gonna work for their end goal no matter what, because those are citizens that know and care about what they're doing. But they need help, we need their help. 
And so cooperating, it means we can say, this is the infrastructure we have available to you. Do you need help with rent overhead? Do you need help with trying to figure out how to access your community members? And that opens up a whole slew of things that we can also talk about regarding education and how to make public schools community centers and meet people where they are. And then we can also say, we know that you already have a diversified economic funding body through grants, through startups, through donors, through committed volunteers, all of these things add up. And the more successful they are, the more competitive they are in grant markets for federal grants, and the more opportunities they have to get more income. Because when you succeed with caring for people, you win long term. That's never something you lose on. And that's what we have to keep betting on as a city. And we have open space. We have resources. We have especially non-monetary things that can help in a huge way. You mean like, like facilities? Like and... facilities, the simple things. Or saying that instead of criminalizing homelessness, we're going to open up a couple, one or two, you know, depending on what our data shows, sobriety outposts. Where instead of putting people who are publicly intoxicated, especially those that probably don't have health care, right, that are maybe homeless, Instead of putting them to the hospital, which is unbelievably expensive infrastructure, which is clogged and there for emergencies. You mean the people who would be, let me, let me get this straight, mm -hmm. you have uh, street people who may have abused some sort of alcohol or substance, instead of, or mm -hmm. substance. Mm -hmm. we're sending them to the emergency room at UNM. Right. And the outcome is uncertain, and it's expensive. Of course. And so there's a different approach that you have in mind. Of course. And we contract out all the ways that they even get to the hospital. Mm -hmm. And with U the University of New Mexico being the only trauma one center in a large radius, we know that it's bogged down infrastructure. We need to keep that more clear for the emergencies it's trying to serve. And we also know that just getting sober and then putting somebody back on the street isn't going to help them. We also know that there's probably no way for them to pay for that, and we're not going to refuse them care in the first place. Right, that's against the law. But exactly. Obviously, they're not going to be able to come up. What is it, about $1,500? Too much. It is okay. far too much. Right. And so. so this not only helps our city, but our state nationally. And this just touches on a big concept I see for Albuquerque. By fixing things here, we become a new standard, not in our state, not even in our region, but nationally and internationally. And that's what we saw with Project ECHO. We did something for us and everyone needed it because the same voids we're experiencing here, we know the specific solutions. We have people working day and night to fix them and our city hasn't celebrated that and given it to the world. We need to start understanding the promise of solutions in Albuquerque. We need to understand that Albuquerque has a future that you have to stay here for because you're not going to believe it. And that's what I've seen and experienced from my community members growing up here and choosing to stay. And it's so empowering. But to the healthcare notion, again, you get them to these sobriety outposts okay. where now they're, you know that we're going to sober them up, right? And then we're going to immediately pair them with resources that they need. If they're homeless, how can we get them in touch with Albuquerque heading home? How can we ask them where they are, what their needs are, how to mm -hmm. help them? We then can get them in touch with counseling services, social workers, community care workers, and now we can start keeping tabs on people. And for transient populations, this is one of the biggest challenges. You don't know where they are. You don't know how they're doing. You don't know if there's a chronic illness about to explode for them. That's massively expensive. Again, hepatitis C can result in obviously either death, which is a long, arduous, and traumatic process because often it ends on a ventilator in an ICU, or you have to get a liver transplant. Either of those solutions are incredibly expensive. And there aren't really solutions at all because, I mean, even if you get the transplant, you're now on immunosuppressants the rest of your life. You are beholden to those expenses. And we can't tell our communities that that's the option. It's about preventative care. It's about accessible care. And now we're creating a more productive workforce. And we can open up jobs through new markets, like solar. There's no way to automate and install solar right now. Okay, so that, that kind of leads me to my next set of questions, which have to do with the economic development in the Albuquerque area, yeah. which has been notoriously uh, flat, recessed. There's a recession still in terms of the jobs available, in terms of the wages being paid. Um, I think we have one of the highest unemployment rates in the country. Mm -hmm. And what you're talking about is like, well, once we fix the health problems, that'll lead to more employable individuals. How are we going to get companies, prof, uh, profitable corporations, uh, effective nonprofits, any sort of manufacturing, how are we gonna get that into the city and what are we going to do to make the economic picture better for citizens like in the in, yeah. even in the short term uh, i think in the past four to eight years i've seen a real decline in the economy here in albuquerque of course. i don't know if it's going to take four to eight years to 
get back to where it was previously. But my question is, how can we get that process started and hopefully ensure that it's not going to be such a long process getting back on track? So the first thing is, like, this comes back down to education. If you look at the journal article, that came, there was a journal article that came out two weeks ago maybe that said, we actually have jobs we can't fill, right? Like it flat out said that, go ahead and check it out. And so we know that we can provide site-specific education for people to fill those jobs. If they're in real need of a job, we can have that opportunity. But also realizing that for right now in our educational system, education can be a huge privilege. Not all of us get the privilege to go out and pursue these options because maybe we're fighting paycheck to paycheck. Maybe we don't have time to take that class or maybe it's too expensive. So what do we do in the interim? We have to create a job market that provides productive infrastructure for us immediately. So there are two ways we can go about okay. it. For able-bodied workers, solar installation. Unbelievably ethical, unbelievably important, requires some training, but we, all, we also get to bolster an industry that already exists here. We get to help companies succeed here. And we do this through public-private partnerships where we start with all the city buildings first. We say, we're going to bite that upfront bullet because that's what large cities do. That's what large infrastructure does. If you're a business converting person, the, converting the solar. 100% uh -huh. an aggressive solar energy plan because we need to say we need to be business uh -huh. smart here. Right. Albuquerque is going to be here for more than 10 years. I'm going, to, I'm going to take that bet any day of the week. If anybody wants to disagree, we can talk it out. But I'm going to say Albuquerque will be here for more than 10 years. And we know that <coughs> solar now can pay itself off in that time. We know that. The technology isn't a future technology anymore. It's here. And if I'm a business owner and I say I can reduce an entire utility in that short of a time frame, and if I can start making money off of it, if I can sell the excess energy on the free market as green energy chips to other places to help pay for my infrastructure here, why wouldn't I have taken that bet? Hmm. Why isn't that something we would have done years ago? And the answers are clear. We know we have an inundated structure here with the oil and gas industry. We see it happening all around us. We see fracking starting to leak into our state. Sure, and we see the still the, the predominance of the gas and oil industry. They are not. Uh, they're not going to go quietly into the night. No, and I'm not coming quietly into this race. No, I, hear I think you. I think that's mm -hmm. the first thing to recognize. And I'm here to fight for a future that no one else is talking no, about. I mean, I'm not trying to yeah. advocate for. It. I'm going to say, mm -hmm. how are we going to? I mean, because really. Gas and oil revenues are, are way down in the yeah. state, and they've suffered for a couple of years. Uh, they're hanging on, though, because of some sort of belief in the, the power of right-wing politics to somehow restore something that's already more expensive. That's a than depleting it's natural that's resource. That's a depleting natural mm -hmm. resource that's more expensive than solar. It's been proven more expensive than wind power. You are right. So their tenaciousness is, is not something that is explainable, but, but there it is, and we do need to make this transformation, and I see what you're saying. One thing leads to another as part of a progressive path forward. Right now, there seem to be some obstacles to that, like the tenacious gas and oil industry, the tenacious right wing that denies climate change. How are we, how are we going to deal with that on a local level so that it becomes evident and then becomes possible to, to move, these are all rational course, yeah. steps that you're talking about, mm -hmm. and I agree completely that there it would result in a, a good, productive, forward-looking city and state and country and world. But how how do we how do we manifest that here at the local level? The first thing is to realize that we are more powerful than we ever thought. That municipalities are a future for freedoms, for ideas, for solutions that we have to take the reins. And we've seen this. Our senators have called for it. Udall, when we left the Paris Agreement, said, we're gridlocked. We all see it. The federal government is doing things that we know aren't sustainable. And now it's up to us. And sadly, this is the same us that's been in power for a long time now and has been choosing to not make these decisions. It's always been there, but choosing mm -hmm. to not make these decisions. But now we see a new opportunity to make it happen. We see mayors cooperating across the country with world leaders from their city to ensure that we keep up with the Paris Agreement, that we will not lose our footing in being competitive in this modern world because somebody's telling us that they don't believe in this. There's no more belief here. There's fact and there's a direction. And that direction is a more sustainable future. And we have the power as the largest urban center in the state, as a responsible party for the future of this state, to make that choice. 
And when we talk about fracking coming into our area, when we're not even doing methane recapturing to help power homes. No, there's that whole methane yeah. rule that, that ended up getting suppressed. Mm -hmm. But um, so yeah, yeah, it's, and mm -hmm. more than that, so we're ignoring what we know we should be doing in the first place right. with this industry that we know is toxic, and now we're jeopardizing the water supply. We know that fracking isn't safe. And again, you know, I'm sure somebody's going to flag me on that and say, "What do you mean? It's great. We have so many standards underwater." That's not true. We know that it's releasing toxic and carcinogenic chemicals. What we have to understand is that you is that Albuquerque, as it oversees the water utility, we're not just responsible for us. We're responsible for a county. We're responsible for this entire water basin. Mm -hmm. And if we don't fight for it, if we don't choose to listen to the protection of this water resource, we are going to be out of literally one of, if not the most important substance on this earth. How long is that going to take to happen? I mean, some people foresee it, that sort of path is going to lead to Albuquerque and most of the middle Rio Grande being uninhabitable within 50, 75 years, right? If those are the numbers, then we should all be terrified. I agree. But that's exactly why I never want to see those years happen. And that's exactly why I choose to run now. August, no one is asking me to run. And I'm sure I read your wonderful column and I understand that no, but people are wondering why... Why there's such this huge field of candidates that, that seemingly seem have sound the same. Sound the same. And, you know, I will say in terms of what you're talking about, you're, you're actually more specific in terms of how you want to achieve your goals and how your goals are part of a bigger picture that involve a real global outlook, but also looking at, as you said, the municipality and municipalities across the nation as being powerful, nearly sovereign powers with the term, in terms of the resources and uh, revenue they have. So why should we be following along with this, you know, gluttony and, and, and nonsense in Washington when we can, at this point, begin to choose our own path. And why should we be listening to the same people that made it impossible to get here in the first place? We need something new. We need something that is steadfast, that is unhindered by next aspirations. We need something that isn't chasing an office, but an ideal and a vision that everyone can get behind because it serves everyone. And Albuquerque, with one less utility, be, what utility bill, isn't nonsense, and it serves everyone. One less utility bill means not only you're not worried that the lights aren't gonna come on, it means that now you have extra money to maybe spend more time with your family. You don't have to take up that second part-time job that's paying you a despicable minimum wage and not giving you benefits because they won't take you on as a full-time employer. It means maybe you can choose to eat healthier food. It means maybe you can choose to recreate more in our wonderful city. That's what community-based solutions look like. That's how we empower people to believe that they're worth as much as they are, which is an unfathomable amount. We chose to live together as a community because we get to do more together. Because we're stronger when we choose to make solutions for ourselves and watch how it benefits all of us. Hmm. And that's something that we haven't seen in this government. This government is leaving cities like Albuquerque behind. We're not a finance capital. We have a different future and a different charge in this world. And the iron is hot for us to take it up. When you look at the technologies coming out of UNM right now, you know we can immediately take a stand in the pharmaceutical world. You know that we can keep going up against the largest industries and say, you may not want this because we understand that we might threaten your profit margins, but there are dedicated people here who want the work, who have the ideas, who have the infrastructure, and we know the rest of the world needs health care. And we are going to work with other nations to ensure that. And we're going to help our community in the process. And eventually, those same standards will fall and will open up something new. That's the promise of this city. And that's what's been hindered. And coming from this infrastructure, working in these labs, hearing the communities, being with my friends through this whole process, I've seen it be more real than I ever could have imagined. So, you know, I mean, you talk a lot in idealistic terms, but what you're saying is an ideal, all these things actually exist. No, yeah, it's not an ideal anymore. Like, <clears throat> I love when people talk about a future as if it's some day that hasn't always been happening before us. You know, we've hit the future. We hit the future yesterday, and it's going to happen again tomorrow. The future isn't some far-off month with flying cars. Yeah, it's right now. The future it's is what we're now. doing. Yeah. And there, there's something so empowering about that. And I think why, especially running as a young person, running who's committed to this city, who's been through the educational system, you know... That's where we need to be. 
that's something that is a perspective I now have in the most sincere and genuine fashion because I was given it. The city gave it to me through all of these things that I'm talking about. I am a product of that future. And when we look at the world's leading technologies, they're not coming from the generation in power right now. The world-changing devices and understandings, the new thought, aren't coming from the people who are making laws. They're reflexive and we're running out of time. Four more years, eight more years, this landscape changes faster and faster. So I'm here now to compete for a future I know isn't far off. Awesome. I want to, do, I want to cover some kind of nuts and yeah, bolts please. things that are uh, more nuts and bolts, mm -hmm. but they have a lot to do with what you say with your yeah, overall vision. Let's talk a little bit about APD, yeah. City Cops. What's your relationship like? What's your relationship with the cops going to be like? How are you going to uh, fix that? that? A lot of people say that means fixing. We've talked about that a lot. But what are your mm -hmm. thoughts? Police officers have always been very kind to me. I, I was T-boned years ago. Uh, I remember being stunned and in a daze, and a police officer was very kind in helping me through that daze and making sure that I was doing the right things and collecting the right information. And I always wanted to go and meet that officer again. But I never was able to find a venue to do that. And so I realized that in some ways our police force had become inaccessible. That I couldn't even show up when I wanted to thank somebody for their work. And that was hard on both ends, because I'm sure officers, especially today, need to hear that. Yeah. Need to hear that so many of them are doing terrific work. And at the same time, I needed to say it as a community member. But we weren't able to. And then as time went on, I found that police officers were, more and, were, were less and less likely to engage in those honest conversations about their experience, because they feel like they're representing the department, I understand they're under fire, and for good reason. We can't be numb, or we can't have amnesia to the shootings that have occurred, to the atrocities that have plagued the city. And for those reasons, we do need a new administration in the police department. And that is something that any, of, any one of these candidates will now tackle. We've heard it before, a new police chief. And anyone who is complicit in the obstruction of the DOJ mandate. All of those people need to go. We need an administration that can be held accountable to the goals it sets. It's been a few years. We're 47% of the way done through that mandate. As a student, if I was only 47% of the way done with anything, I would have never passed a single class. We have to be steadfast in meeting our goals, even when they're hard. We have to go at them 100%. We have to be visible. We have to be transparent. We have to be accessible. And we have to be committed. And that's what we haven't seen out of the department's leadership. And that's affecting, I believe, patrol officers negatively because it's affecting community relations. How's that affecting patrol officers? I mean, one thing I've noticed is like the police presence in Albuquerque is like way down. Yeah. We just don't see them. We don't have enough cops and everyone knows right now. The statistics are out. We are the number one car theft city in the United States right now. Right. And you know, the, the answer is simple there is we don't have the staff for it. So people are upset that they don't feel like they're protected in property, in place, and in self, and the police officers are strained. When you're strained like that, you don't do your best work. You can't get through all those thefts. We have to support our police by getting more officers. We have to support our police through better education to meet the DOJ mandate. And we have to be sure that the public understands the actions we're taking and that we are here to support them. That isn't something that'll take a whole four years. If we commit to the DOJ mandate, that's something that happens fast. When we show that this is a city ready to change and do the right things for the community, I believe that is a culture shift that can happen faster than we think. Because we know that this culture of aggression that's accumulated and that the DOJ report pointed out in 2014 is prevalent. We felt it in our communities. We felt that City Hall has been unresponsive to our demands as a community to fix it. And that's not government at all. Well, the way they've kind of fixed it, I see, is that they've just gone off the map. Yeah, oh, totally. Um, you know, citizen police interactions mm -hmm. are now kept to a minimum. Of course. That's what I think was, was kind of like the implicit mm -hmm. solution for the current, knowing that the, they'd have to um, bear with things through this next mayoral election. For sure. And uh, you, you brought up an interesting thing about APD, though, which was the high shootings a lot of people forget about, and a lot of different sort of people talking about issues around the city point to those shootings where some policemen were killed uh, in horrifying yeah. ways. That was an awful year. It was an awful year, but that set in motion, apparently. An escalation. It mm -hmm. escalated a, a situation yeah. that really, uh, and, and gave power to this clique of uh, ultra, you know. Ultra aggressive ultra leadership. Ultra aggressive mm -hmm. leadership. It's a good way to put it. 
the, how do I mean? And again, that's a, that was a healthcare thing. This individual was someone who had been pretty much abandoned by the healthcare system, was not, you know, being properly uh, treated, and, and people died because yeah. of that. So. I think you hit it on the head there. It was a health issue that was dealt with poorly, and it ended up being tragic for a whole community. Right. And that's happening everywhere where healthcare doesn't succeed. Exactly. And where we don't have the resources necessary to make sure that our most uh, helpless, marginalized citizens are not, you know, give, you know given the care totally. they need to, to at least, succeed, you know, nominally succeed and be part of the, the culture. And I want to make this abundantly clear because there's this whole kind of myth that runs around, especially our society today, that caring for people when they need the hand up um, is a waste of taxpayer dollars or it's draining on the infrastructure. Caring for someone in a preventative fashion, let's do healthcare for instance, is always cheaper. Always cheaper. Them seeing a healthcare professional, them getting attended to even in home, is always cheaper than the end result of chronic illnesses like hepatitis C. For the community in emotional terms, for taxpayer dollars, it is always cheaper. When we have to pay millions of dollars in settlement because our police don't handle a situation correctly, it is always cheaper that we gave them that education. Preventing these things is how we create a safer tomorrow, a more lucrative tomorrow, and a better one for all of us. There is no dollars that are misspent when we provide education and prevention. Because I'm tired of seeing heroin ravage this town. I am tired of seeing these stoppable forces accumulate around us. Because we have the power. We just didn't realize where the resources needed to go. How about resources? Mm -hmm. um, speaking of resources and building the community back up, a lot of the things you talk about have to do with education yeah. and properly preparing citizens for their roles in the community, mm -hmm. whatever those roles may yeah. be. How, what about education? How are we how are we approaching education in the city? Is it right or wrong? Does APS need to be broken up? Again, general sorts of question. How does education play into all this? Is the city where it's at in terms of schooling for its citizens? How, how would you how would you change that stuff? Wow. Um, so first of all, I want to do something that's rarely said. And at first, I want to say thanks to our public schools. Um, my public school experience provided me everything. Remind me where you went again? Albuquerque High School. Bandelier, Jefferson, Albuquerque High. Good that's schools. Wonderful, awesome. wonderful yeah. schools. Yeah. Um, and my educators mean everything to me. They are still my mentors. They are still my friends. They are still people I talk to and meet up with and ask for advice. And the school structure I want is the one that allows for maximum teacher empowerment. And that's the bottom line. And I've had conversations about, do we break up the district? Is that something that allows for more uh, teacher empowerment? And many of the teachers feel that that just creates more administration for them to get through. Mm -hmm. And so if that's their feeling and if that's their experience and if they have other solutions for how the city can support their empowerment, then we need to ensure that we're doing that. One of the things that I'm interested in is bringing back the stipend program that existed uh, under other mayors in the city and saying that, you know, we know that we pay teachers abysmal amounts of money. Despicable. They are, some of, they are the cornerstone of any society. We need educators. And they do great jobs. Educators do phenomenal work. And we need to say that, you know, we can offer you a stipend, a modest one, but still more income if you once a week even put on an after-school club based on your interests, needs you see in the community, but give these people another place to be that maybe isn't about structured learning, that is about interests. And it still growth. shows them the importance of the institution called school mm -hmm. We're and the school. stuff that you can access because of the thing called yeah. school. Information, Course. recreation, fellowship. Because learning is everything. Community. Yes, right. and that's, that's what yeah. we need. We need this sense of community, and we need more after-school programs that... We can put nonprofits into schools, again, structural overhead saying, look, here's a venue that you don't have to deal with transportation to and from. We can have them here. We can work with APS on bus scheduling. I know it's difficult. But there's a lot of places the buses need to be, but these are all things that we know we could make malleable for lower costs than having these places be siloed off, not accessing the communities where they are. For helping our undocumented communities, making sure their resources are at a school so that they can be accessed by a family together that everybody can know that schools are a safe place for all of our community members. 
And that is especially because we know that undocumented communities are marginalized in society, socioeconomically. Um, for them to have that time, if their one time to pick up a child is what they have between jobs, we need the resource to be there. We need them to be able to have a place where they can go to check in, to say things are okay, or this is what I need, or what support systems are available. And then we bring that in the open. We say this is okay together. And we start putting more and more things in these schools so that there's always something. And if you look at Enlace, which is a wonderful program, there was an Enlace office in Albuquerque High School. And you bet more kids used it there. You bet they learned there and they engaged there and they got the better outcomes that save us money. That's why we have public schools, because it's something for everyone. And we all learn from the experience of using those resources together. Hmm. Okay, very good. Finally, let's talk a little bit about immigration. I knew that something you wanted to talk about a lot and let's discuss at the forum. It kind of came up a little bit in your discussion of, that we just initiated about education. Again, Albuquerque and immigration, community that has been dependent on and continues to celebrate yeah. its immigrant roots. How 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 do you how do you visualize what's your vision for Albuquerque as an immigrant friendly and uh, immigrant friendly city that is also supportive of human rights? Yeah. Um, first of all, I'm I'm glad in some ways that one of the atrocities Gen Attorney General Sessions has committed uh, has brought to light this issue. But I'm also sad that the conversation has led us to think that we were ever doing enough before. Because like so many parts of our culture and identity in New Mexico, we celebrate it, but then we disinclude it as soon as the celebration's over. If any of us think we were doing enough for undocumented communities in 2016 or in the Obama administration, we weren't paying attention. We didn't know what was going on. And so it's about making sure that they feel supported in the resources, in their availability to those resources, and making sure that departments that are created for these communities are actually staffed and are more than a press release and are instead really made available for and by that community. One such group that's doing incredible work and that I can't speak highly enough is the New Mexico Dream Team. For and by the people it's trying to serve, unbelievably engaged, active, just forces of nature who do work other places too, who get wonderful degrees, who are incredible scientists, who are avid learners and some of the best citizens I know in this community. And they said, we can do this better because we've been left behind. And they have been. And they're right, they can do it better than us. I don't know those struggles. I accept and understand my privilege every single day of the week. And it's about making sure our city is made in such a way that they get to make their answers, that they get to make their solutions. And we listen. We don't take up space in those conversations anymore. And we provide outlets that they need. So I welcome groups like that to providing the resources that, or to telling us what resources they need, and we will make sure we're helping. We'll make sure we are giving them those resources and that they deliver it to the community as it is needed. Excellent. I'm, I'm kind of taking, I'm, I'm going to say that, uh, you're implying that we're not going to uh, we're not going to allow, our, our, under your administration, we're not going to allow uh, our police force to interact with. Uh, ICE will not be in our jails. ICE will not be threatening our communities. We will be sure that we are here to protect and serve our communities. What about this thing where they were told uh, we were told ICE agents show up at, at the federal courthouse mm -hmm. looking for city residents who may be eligible for deportation. What do you think of that? They can get a warrant. Okay, otherwise they shouldn't even be there, yeah. right? Don't ask. It's, it's, not, it's not any business. Because that's our community and we're here for it, day and night, no matter what. Those are the people that truly give us profound community and work. And we're responsible for them. And we're grateful for them. Let me ask you just one more thing. What do you have to add? What do you want to add? This has been a great interview. I want you to just maybe kind of speak freely for a couple of minutes about your desire to be mayor and, and why, like, I know it's a campaign sort of thing, but why should people vote for you? Obviously, you're literate, you're informed, you're eager, you've got youth on your side. What else should people be thinking when they go to the polls and see your name on the 
ballot. One of the biggest reasons I'm running is that I feel people have been asking for something different and ethical and something that isn't inundated within this structure. And if those are the things that you've been concerned about, if those are the things you're wondering about, and you want somebody who knows these issues, who's been here, who didn't leave, and who chose and understood this city as an unbelievable promised land of opportunity through community engagement, then I need your help. Because that's what I'm here for. Because if you believe that we do need youth in politics, then I'm, I'm stepping into this arena because I agree with you. And that youth in politics to me doesn't mean me volunteering for someone else's campaign when I don't agree with how, agree with how they got here or what they're going to do or their future aspirations or who they're going to bring in. Youth in politics doesn't mean me starting where other people tell me I should or continuing the stair-stepping career politician dialogue that gives us this system. Youth in politics means these are ideas that I know only happen from this office. Youth in politics means this is a future that no one else imagined and I'm here to advocate for. And I'm here to point to every single place that makes it real. Because those are all the places that made this candidacy viable and real too. And I can't give up on that. And I hope that this community, for how much it's given me and my friends and so many others, is willing to come out and give again and do something different. Because that's what the high desert teaches us to do. We've always had to do it different. And this is the tipping point. And I hope there are people willing to do it different with me today. So awesome. thank you for having me on this. Hey, thanks, man. Great. It's Great a pleasure. Yeah. Really.